welcome to worship on this, the first Sunday after Christmas, uh, otherwise known as Boxing Day. And it's a day when uh, traditionally uh, gentry in England, uh, like Lord and the Countess of Grantham that we've met in Downton Abbey, uh, would give out boxes with gifts to their tenants and servants. And from there, it expanded into a custom where rich people uh, would give boxes, would give gifts to the poor. So Boxing Day for us may be a time when we're accustomed to eating leftover turkey and in our pre-COVID days uh, to visiting with family and friends, you know, sharing our Christmas goodies and admiring each other's uh, presence. It's a time when some would rush to malls and big box stores in search of, uh, you know, bargains, and others would be glad to put up their feet and just relax after all the hubbub and the hurrying and scurrying to get ready for Christmas. For us today, it's a time to gather uh, digitally for worship. Uh, for carols, and we've had a good warm up with three carols, so I hope that's got everyone's juices flowing. And we're going to have some stories, we're having candles and prayer. So let us begin uh, by acknowledging the land. We, uh, we acknowledge that the land op upon which we worship was stewarded for many centuries by Indigenous communities. Many of these communities still call this land their home. We especially acknowledge the Mississauga of the Credit River with whom we are in relationship through the Williams Treaty. May we continue to strive to live in right relationship with indigenous people and work to protect the land for this and future generations. I'd invite you to join in the uh, lighting by lighting a candle at your home. So here, so we welcome the good news of your presence in Jesus the Christ, who revealed your way of hope, peace, joy, and love. May your way shine through us, amen. And let us join together in the call to worship. Praise God from the heavens. Give praise in the heights. Give praise all you angels. Praise God all you hosts. Praise God, sun and moon. Give praise stars and lights. Praise God, farthest heavens. Let all things Praise God, who gives strength to human beings and lifts voices in songs of praise. Let us join together in our carol, Once in Royal David City. Once in Royal David City stood a lonely cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for a bed. There it was that Oh, 
on Christmas Eve, uh, the spotlight was on the little town of Bethlehem and on a stable, crude and bare. And in that stable on a manger with a baby lying in that amongst that straw and a young mother and an older man standing protectively by. Well, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, time has passed and the spotlight now is on the city of Jerusalem. And I don't know how well you can see it, but the needle point on the wall is the city of Jerusalem. So you can see kind of the old wall and some houses. But our spotlight today rests on the temple. And you need to use your imaginations to uh, picture a place uh, with white marble walls and gilt edges. And it's a splendid place up on a, a hilltop. So people will climb up to this splendid edifice. And amongst the people who are coming to pray and to offer sacrifices is the same couple we met on Christmas Eve in that stable. Now this carpenter and Mary from Nazareth, which is a little hill town, and their baby Jesus look, if anything, even more out of place in the temple. They don't look as if they belong. And they're here because they are pious Jews and they want to fulfill their religious obligations. And according to the Torah, to the law, if a baby, the firstborn baby is male, he belongs to God. Just like you may remember Samuel, Hannah's son, and how he served Eli. So if you want to redeem him, if you don't want him to have to go to the temple and serve God, you need to offer, in Jesus' time, it was a, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Joseph and Mary, with baby Jesus, are waiting patiently with other parents and their sons to go before the priest so that they can perform this ceremony. And as they're standing there, along comes Simeon whose name means obedient or listening. And this Simeon is a resident of Jerusalem and he's an elder. He's someone who's been watching and waiting for the Messiah. And he's hoping against hope that he will see the Messiah before he dies. And I'm just trying to imagine, you know, how many children, how many babies has he seen in those years of watching and waiting? So once more, he's in the temple and he's there and he looks and his eyes linger on this baby. And he recognizes something in him. And I am mystified personally by this because I know you who are parents will say that your one month old was unique and special and you would know that boy anywhere but personally I think one month olds look much the same but here Simeon looks at this one month old in the arms of his parents and Simeon realizes that here is the Messiah. You know, he's, he's been watching and he's been waiting year after year and somehow his eyes are still open to possibility. He has not given way to disappointment. He has not caved in to despair. He's kept hoping. And now he sees this baby and he takes him into his arms. And I love to imagine that scene. And I don't know how you picture it, but I've got the image in my mind is my father when he was in his mid nineties and his hair was this fluffy snow white and his face was wrinkled, but it also his expression on his face was one of great contentment as he held his great grandson, Evan J. Butler, in his arms, you know, that, that look. And so that's how I imagine Simeon 
holding Jesus. And as he holds this baby, his mouth is open and he sings. And he sings, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that have you have prepared for in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. So if, if that isn't startling and amazing enough, can you imagine the parents standing there and say, what is going on? Along comes Anna. And Anna has been a widow for many years. We imagine she's probably in her mid 80s. She's been living in the temple. She's been praying and fasting. She's a prophet recognized as a spokesperson for God. She comes along and she too recognizes that here indeed is the Messiah. And she sings, how long, O God, have I waited for a sure sign of liberation, waited with hope, waited in faith for the dawning of this day. And now I have looked into human face and seen the face of God. And so she wants to tell everyone and anyone about this child. So here we have two people who have watched and waited and finally they see the Messiah. Now, neither Simeon nor Anna will see Jesus grow to adulthood. They'll never have the opportunity to watch him heal or listen to him teach. They won't be able to join him at table as he eats bread and drinks wine with sinners and tax collectors, with Pharisees and the cream of society. They won't be there as the crowds gather around him or as the Roman soldiers take him away to be executed. And they certainly won't be around to see followers of Jesus, followers of the way, spreading that good news all throughout the Mediterranean basin. But, but they have had this little glimpse of the future and that's enough to fill them with joy and give them hope. As human beings, we know that things do not always turn out the way we hope and the way we plan. If we didn't know it before, we have certainly learned that in the last two years. And as mature adults, we have probably had the experience of sowing seeds and watching for them to grow, but not being around for the harvest. And that's difficult. We always want to see the end. We want to see the results. But like Anna and Simeon, we can keep our eyes open to possibility and our minds to wonder and our hearts to hope. And I'd like to leave you this section. Not This isn't the end of the service, so don't run away. Uh, but this poem, this stanza of a poem from Iona. It is not in the manger Christ must stay, forever lying helpless in the hay. It is by older folk Jesus is blessed, who see God's restlessness in him expressed. Let's join together in another carol. We've got, O Come All Ye Faithful.
So we now come to story time. So I'm not sure how you were when you were a child, but one of my favorite things in the entire world was being read to. And our teachers at public school, if we were really, really good, uh, that was the reward. They'd read us a chapter of a book. And so I want to share with you this story. And I looked in my records. I don't think I've shared it with Richmond Hill before, but I think it's a, a beautiful Christmas story. So I invite you to relax. Um, however you usually listen to a story, if you like to close your eyes and imagine whatever's best for you, we are just going to hear this story. So it's called The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy. But in fact, his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and never laughed. He complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too loudly, and that the children played too shrilly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. He spent his days sitting at a workbench, carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in the straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple in his chin since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard. The village people didn't know, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled till his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. There stood a woman and a young boy, about seven years old. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I need something carved. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered that they were lost. I'd hoped that by some miracle, I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There are no such things as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready. The following week, there was a knock in the woodcarver store. There stood the wood widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch your work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped up Thomas. 
with a grumble, the wood carver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread and she sat down with her knitting by the fire. Thomas sat very still. After a long time, Thomas cleared his throat <coughs> and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes, so he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The wood carver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needle stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. Sheep are sheep. They cannot look happy. <clears throat> Mine did, said Thomas. They knew they were with baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, so I've got a happy sheep just to show you. You can have a happy sheep. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bell chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful racket. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. That evening, after a supper of cornbread with boiled potatoes, the wood carver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife, he picked up the sheep, he worked with his, until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. May I watch again? I'll be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it is almost impossible to be seven and eat a warm, sticky raisin bread without making various smacking, licking, satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Grunt, is that my cow you're carving? Nod and grunt. Another very long time went by. Then Thomas cleared his throat and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That is a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I have ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. Cows are cows. They cannot look proud. My cow did. I knew that Jesus chose to be born in the stable, in the barn, so it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sound that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Doomy muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife. He picked up the cow, and I've got, I think, a proud looking cow. 
He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door was the widow and her son. May I watch again? asked Thomas. As Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench, Thomas watched the wood carver, carver work on the figure of an angel. After a very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes. And would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? <laughs> Well, my angel looked like the one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? You'll be able to do it. You are the best wood carver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, May I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up, what is your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I am a very busy man. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope. I like robins. With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the wood carver strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of the wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt. Then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife. He picked up the angel. He carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly springs dotted with berries. And there stood Thomas clutching the partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me about all the mistakes I am going to make. Well, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus. And my Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt. At the door was the widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. 
When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I am about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? They were the most special of all. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother and Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready? Asked the widow McDowell. They will be ready when they are ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents. That's exactly why we are giving them. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly, he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand knit, warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved a pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to, to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded that sketch into a ball and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mound of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up the block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat, and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard. From it, he took out a rough woolen shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. From the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed, Two tears trailed into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the wood carver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel, with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men, wearing their most wonderful robes edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Jesus. He unpacked Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. That day, Jonathan went to Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as an August sky, and laugh. No one ever called him 
Mr. Gloomy again. We have a Christmas carol because obviously after a happy story, we've got to sing some more. Let us come together in prayer. God of Christmas, of angel choirs and surprise shepherds, of parents doing their best for their little baby and seniors beholding in joy and wonder the long awaited Messiah. We pause to thank you for the gift of this particular Christmas. We had so hoped that by now COVID would be behind us, that we could travel once more and freely gather with family and friends. But even in the midst of these ever-changing restrictions, we are grateful for the opportunities we do have to celebrate. We pray for all who are feeling disappointed, who are struggling as plans had to be canceled and holiday gatherings postponed yet again. God of generations, 
Your love encompasses all of humankind, bringing joy to young and old alike. We are thankful for those moments when our hearts sing and our bodies break into dance. We pray for all who are feeling heavy hearted. We remember those who are suffering because of natural disasters, Filipinos and Americans who experience loss of life and property through typhoon and tornadoes. People in British Columbia who have gone through wildfires, floods and landslides. We remember all who are mourning the loss of a loved one. Especially this morning, we think of the family and friends of the anti-apartheid champion, Desmond Tutu. We name in silence and hold in the light and warmth of your love individuals we know who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. All these are prayers we lift to you in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray. Eternal spirit, life giver, pain bearer, love maker, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together in our closing carol, which is Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
We have journeyed through the four weeks of Advent and into the Christmas season. The waiting is over. Jesus is born. We extinguish the first candle of Advent as a symbol that Jesus, the hope of the world, is now born anew within each of us and goes with us to brighten our darkest moments. We extinguish the second candle of Advent as a symbol of the peace of Christ that we all take forth from this place to share with the hurting world. We extinguish the third candle of Advent. Take joy home with you and may it shine this coming year in all our lives. We now extinguish the fourth candle of Advent. May the love of God so abundantly given to each one of us shine in our hearts and homes and freely overflow into the world around us. Amen. Amen.